Thank you very much, Leighton. Let's see if I can get these slides to work. Not quite. Uh, you all had this card in your packet, so my contact information is on there. So I'm not going to spend any more time on it. Uh, <clears throat> we have a world here. It's your world, but it's kind of been taken away by Al Gore and the IPCC. Now, how did they take it away? Well, they told you sea level was going to rise. In fact, this is the specter that you're getting. This is Heidi Cullum's book, Weather of the Future. This will never happen. Not in anybody's lifetime in this room or anybody anywhere else. Uh, but it does sell books. And that's one of the problems uh, we're being sold a bill of goods. This is the, let me go back into the past. Uh, about 130,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago, we had sea levels approaching what we have today, right up here. Then the, the giant glaciers formed uh, when they started melting 18,000 years ago. Sea levels rose again, and now they've kind of flattened out. The IPCC is predicting something else. Uh, they're saying that uh, by the end of this century, we're going to have one additional meter of sea level rise in their highest, uh, what they call them representative concentration pathways. Uh, and they're related to CO2. More emissions, the greater the pathway. Uh, one meter is almost, uh, it's about 40 inches. Uh, that's an awful lot of sea level rise in, in a century. Now, not to be outdone, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers decides, well, we're going to go for two meters, uh, 1.8 really, and they have three different pathways, uh, scenario one, two, and three, and well, this is the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, let's see, this is not working. There we go. Let me go back one more. Did I get the right one here? Yeah. This is now the uh, National Climate Assessment that was just published a few weeks ago. Now they're saying six and a half feet. The lowest is 20 centimeters down here, and that is still double the rate that we've had sea level rise in the last 170 years. Uh, they're never going to see the top one either. Now this is Jim Hansen. Now Jim Hansen, by the way, if we go back, uh, in 1988, he was asked by a reporter, uh, how do you see things in 40 years? And he says, well, you see the highway down there, the Westside Highway outside of his office? It's not going to be there anymore. Uh, based on a doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial times. Well, right now we've gone uh, 25 years into that 40 years. We've had one inch of sea level rise. There are 10 feet to go for him to make his prediction, and it's got to happen within the next 15 years. You take a look at the, let's see. This is Jim Hansen's slide uh, where he decided, realizing that sea level was not rising, he said it's really going to be exponential. So by the mid-century, it really isn't going to rise at all. He won't even be alive here, neither will I. Uh, and yet we're going to get four, four meters of rise. Now this is meters, not feet, in the last uh, 20 years of the century. <clears throat> Uh, don't hold your breath on this one either. This is uh, La Jolla. Now, you heard about La Jolla this morning. Scripps Howard is there. I go back here. Let's start it again. This is in 1872. The same piece of land. The sea level hasn't risen. I'll go through this one more time. Same beach, same place. So there is sea level rise, but not much. So what's really causing it? Well, we have three different sources of sea level rise that we can measure, three different metrics. We have tide gauges. We have American satellite and French satellite. And we have NVSAT, which is the latest European satellite. The thing that is, first of all, you notice the, different, the metrics are all different. Tide gauges average about 1.7 millimeters a year. Uh, Topex Poseidon 3.1, uh, MVSAT is all over the place. But the characteristic they all have in common is they're all linear. They're all measuring a linear trend. And are they perfect? No. Let's see if I can. This is what a tide gauge looked like. This one happens to be up in New Hampshire. Uh, they're all over the world. 
Some of them have been around for a long time. Now, parts of the world have sea levels subsiding and, ri and raising. Why? Because the land next to it is subsiding or, 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 or uh, increasing. Uh, some of them are more reliable. They've been around. There is a bias to them. Why is there a bias? Well, people tend to put tide gauges in where the sea level is, quote, rising or their land is dropping. So the coast of Norway doesn't have too many, but Holland has a lot because they're worried about it. So there is a bias in, in, in even the tide gauges, and they are direct measurement, and they are still linear. This is what the permanent sea level uh, site from the British looks like. You click on your city, and you get a map that looks like that. And uh, this is, happens to be New York City. It's linear. However, sea level is rising. Oh, why? They put their tide gauge on a battery in New York City. The battery is landfill. And they're putting buildings on that landfill. Well, Jews, this, <coughs> they're going down. Near New York City, New Rochelle, Port Jeff, sea level is fairly static. This is a, a subset of that time period. Boston's the same, by the way. After 1960, Boston sea level goes up because Boston is sinking. They put up 19 skyscrapers in 20 years. <coughs> Let's see. OK, here's the brilliant Axel Murner put together a way to really look at this. And, and what he did is he took uh, all the tide gauges in the United States, he grouped them into parts where the, is, the land is uplifting, where the land is uh, going down. You notice there's more of those. And in the center, you can actually tell what the real tide gauge, uh, what the re real measure of the sea level is as far as the tide gauges are concerned. Uh, the guy's a genius. This is what satellites do, and this is the other measure. This is Topex Poseidon. Uh, they fly over the ocean, they, they look at the ocean topography, and it's very hard for radar, by the way, to reflect off a wave. Why? Because if the, you have a high wave and radar hits it, it bounces off and doesn't get reflected. So you have to increase the footprint that you're measuring. And when you do that, usually you have a lot of wave action in low pressure systems, which actually makes the sea level rise. There are all kinds of different uh, changes that can happen. However, the measure is still linear. Uh, this is what the uh, Topex Jason uh, group looks like in space. This is what the University of Colorado puts out as a measure of sea level rise. Again, it's linear. But look carefully uh, at this area right here. Here we have uh, in, in the late 1990s, and also here you have a tremendous increase in sea level. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see if I can get the dates right for this. Yeah, uh, 1998 to 2011, big rise. The fall here, by the way, is, is due to rainfall falling on Australia. They had tremendous storms. And it, what it did is it replenished the Australian aquifers and didn't go back into the ocean. So you actually have a little drop in sea level here. Here's the other rise. Those rises are significant. Uh, let's see. Axel Murner said, nope. We got to change that chart and flatten it. Why? Because the stations were grounded improperly. There's a paper of his. I'll give you the citation for the paper uh, in, in the Q&A if you need it. Uh, Axel Murner is uh, quite correct, maybe not that severe, but we're going to find out how correct in, in a minute. Uh, this is the problem with the satellites. The satellites aren't that precise. The resolution of it, the best resolution is 23 millimeters in wavelength. You're, you're trying to measure something one and two millimeters, and you're using a yardstick that can't measure it. It's like measuring this little box here with this yardstick, and it's quite difficult. And how do you do that? Well, you make 6,000 of these measurements, and you hope sooner or later you get it right. And that's exactly how they measure it with the low resolution they have on the radars. Uh, traffic, tracking error is also in the 20 to 40 millimeter range, not good. Uh, this is the European's answer, a flying boxcar. It's called Envisat. Uh, it has sub-millimeter resolution. Uh, this is what it looked like in the lab. Uh, Envisat, notice, is different. It actually, about a, this is the raw data from Envisat a couple of years ago, about a half millimeter per year uh, sea level rise, much lower than Topix Poseidon, which is in the three millimeter range. Well, how, how does that happen? What do we do about that? Uh, first of all, this is, they, they adjusted NVSAT a little bit. This is how precise it is, by the way. You notice the high points 
are always in January of each year. There's a two millimeter variation each year in sea level rise. This is very, very precise. Now, how come that happens? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we have something that's called <coughs> the oceans expand when you heat them. Well, the view in January of the southern oceans is basically all water. This is courtesy of Guy Otwell. Uh, if you imagine the opposite, uh, the winter view in the south, which is our summer view, you have Asia and North America, lots of land, but not a lot of ocean. So th therefore, you have the, the sea level actually dropping because thermal expansion gets lower. So you have a, within a, any given year, you have that two millimeter range. But you have a real precise satellite to show you, which is great. Uh, this is the original raw data from MVSAT. Then they corrected it, they corrected it further. Here is the big problem. This is the sun, this is our solar cycle, this is the sunspot cycle. Remember the years I talked about uh, that were crucial in the uh, satellite imagery. Right around here, we're showing sea level rise. And right here, 2011 to 2014, we're showing sea level rise. Now, why would solar and sunspot activities make the oceans rise? Is, is it uh, thermal expansion? No, it really isn't. What's happening here is that when you have high sunspot activity, the Earth's atmosphere itself expands into a balloon. The people think that these satellites fly in space. They don't. They fly in the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. And it looks something like this. Uh, this is Brownian motion. These, you have to imagine these as being little particles up where the, where the satellites fly. And if you expand the atmosphere, there's more of them. You have a decimal point, six or seven zeros before the first one shows up that will impact the momentum of that satellite. But it does happen. It's called orbital degradation. And orbital degradation will make a satellite think that the sea level is going up. Why? Because the satellite is going down. This is the difference. Uh, NVSAT and, and Topix Poseidon, we had to resolve that difference between 1 and 2.6 millimeters. And the you know, only way to do it is this way. Because the tracking resolution doesn't work, this is called the transit measurement. What we do is we wait one year and we track when a satellite crosses that line. If the satellite crosses the line a little bit early, then we know it is in a lower orbit. With an atomic clock, we could be very precise at knowing exactly when. It's an experiment NASA needs to do. The Europeans are thinking about doing it. Uh, this is uh, something that you will not see, a world that Al Gore and the IPC want to give you. Uh, sorry, folks. Uh, this is the world you deserve. It's the world that Axel Murner, Willie Soon, and our group of scientists here want to leave you with. And I want to thank you very much for the privilege.